Hello gamers, I am your host, Mike Zorch, and uh, this went a little late. I've been streamlining how I produce videos, and so I've been working on some stuff. So that's why this one's a little late, getting out the door. Uh, and also I've been increasing the number of videos that I do for Gamers Bay. That channel is monetized, and so I've been helping them produce a lot more videos to get them out the door but that doesn't mean that i'm going to stop producing videos for gamers bay in fact um i also plan to get back into live streaming for gamers bay uh still up in the air as to whether or not i will stream on here on youtube and just stream on twitch or what i don't know i I'll probably still will uh because uh that doesn't change and I don't know. I, 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 it's still up in the air, but I think I still will. Um, most likely, I will be streaming Lost Ark. Uh, I've been wanting to get into that. I picked up the pound, Founders Pack and I played it for a few hours uh, beginning uh, on, on launch day. And I've been wanting to get back into it. And I will probably, probably stream my gameplay of that. So, today... We're going to be doing uh, in another Inside Star Citizen. And this is an important year for Star Citizen. It is not only their 10th anniversary. This is the year they really need to produce. They need to produce something. Because they've been, they've been at this for a while. Um, what lo most people don't realize is that the current iteration of Star Citizen, the one that's currently available to play now in Alpha, that didn't exist until 2015. There was a version prior. There was some tech that was developed prior. It was originally going to be slated for a 2018 launch, but that was scrapped when the community voted to continue development. It was originally going to be something a little more like, you know, not much different than what uh, Elite Dangerous Odyssey is now. There was not going to be many planet landings. Uh... There was space legs, but it was going to be more like a, a, a freelancer. Or, as I said, more like what Elite Dangerous Odyssey is now. It was nowhere near as huge in scope. And so they restarted development in 2015 with the game and came out with the what we, what we now know as the 3.0 Alpha. They really should have called it 1.0. Instead of calling it 3.0, they really should have called it 1.0. That would have eliminated a lot of confusion and would have prevented a lot of people from thinking that they've been in development for that long when really they haven't. Anyway, um, the developers have been working on really hard. They're focusing, like, they're just laser focused now on getting pyro out the door. Pyro is the next star system for the game. They've been using the Stanton system as a petri dish for ideas and and everything because they've been they've been building this game from scratch. Literally. They've taken an existing engine and they've completely retooled it. That took a long time to do and they're still working on it. They've got old legacy code from the older version that they that they scrapped that are still that they were using that's still in there that they have to get rid of. So they've got new UI stuff that will replace that. They've got old legacy code they've got to get rid of. Uh, they've got some incredibly complicated server side stuff that they have to implement to make this game an MMO, which is what it's going to be. It's going to be a massive space MMO. And it takes some really complicated stuff behind. And Tiger and I are going to have to do a video explaining that. Maybe, maybe I'll ask the professor to get him on to talk about what they're doing. Uh, why it's so complicated behind the scenes and why it's been taking so long. Maybe I'll I'll do that. I'll, I'll ask the professor to bring Tiger on and, and discuss server meshing and 
all everything of what that is and what it will entail and what it will mean for the game and why it's so important and why it's so damn complicated. It's the most complicated thing that they've been working on and it's been taking them years to, to finish it and they're finally getting to the point to where they can implement a static version of it and then later they'll implement a dynamic version of it that will allow more than just 50 people to play together at one time. Oh, well, anyway, uh... This episode is Sprint Stint. Boy, is that appropriate considering what they're doing. Consider it that they are just laser-focused on getting Pyro out the door. Pyro's important. Pyro... bringing out Pyro will show that they can really do this and they've also been heavily focused on getting squadron 42 finished we know that they have chaps all the chapters done they've got all the missions done so they just have to finish everything up and if they get that done then that means they'll have gen 12 renderer and vulcan done and since Squadron 42 and Star Citizen are tied at the hip and share the same technology, that will be coming to Star Citizen. Gen 12 Renderer, which will be another big deal. We should also talk about that. And uh, the move from DirectX to Vulcan. Anyway, uh, let's watch this video. Let's see what Jared's got for us today. Welcome to an all Sprint Report edition of Inside Star Citizen. I'm Jared Huckabee, and let's get into it. Following our look at new derelict concepts a couple weeks ago, I haven't looked at these members yet. of the environment these are in the game. the process of building the individual pieces that can be used to bring them to life, starting with the big mammer jammer itself, the Reclaimer. Ah. Now this okay, now they do have... They do have some of these in the game now. They are um, caterpillars. And I think they have a starfarer, which is the refueler, in them. And there's missions tied to them where you have to go and collect stuff from them. And sometimes there's hostile NPCs there. But not all the time, but sometimes there are. So there are in the game. I haven't gone and seen them yet. Uh, there are so many games that I want to play. I really want to play this one. Um, Xeno Threat is out, and I want to join the Garden Initiative in some of those and stream it. This is sort of like a reverse white box phase where environment artists take the completed work of ship artists and then begin to hmm. break it down, stripping it of all the extraneous parts and then bending and twisting the superstructure. See all the detail that's in these ships when they're crashed? That's actually a part of the ship design. Uh, if you accidentally phase into the wall of a ship, you will see really complex structures on the inside. These ships are designed to break apart. The, the code for it isn't in the game yet, but they're designed to, to break apart because at some point, the, games won't, the ships won't just explode. They will break apart if you damage them enough. Now, if you, you hit the, you know, uh, the main power supply or the quantum drive, it will probably still blow up. But um, any, other, any other way, you'll probably just break the ship up. And because that's a part of the salvage gameplay, where you can actually go out and break a damaged ship down and sell the materials, the processed materials. And destroying a ship may not always kill the crew. There might still be crew members aboard, especially if it's a bigger ship. You break a ship in two, you'll probably have to send people in to kill the rest of the crew and to get their cargo. Structure in ways appropriate for a wreck that's mm -hmm. one, two, or perhaps even 10 years old. Wow. What you're seeing here is the beginnings of a, a derelict zoo, as it were. 
creating the buffet of basic mm. forms that designers and other artists will be able to pull from to continue their specific work building out the various points of interest players can explore mm. on the planets and moons of Stanton, Pyro, and beyond. It's early days, and this simple Reclaimer derelict zoo will continue to evolve over the coming weeks, in addition to many of the others seen in previous These will be huge, because re the the Reclaimer is a into the persistent universe monster of a ship. The team is also exploring early advanced traversal opportunities for some of the outlaw space stations currently being built for the Pyro system. If you remember the most mm. recent CitizenCon demo, advanced traversal are ways to get around or through an environment beyond the critical path most people usually stick to. Now, by following a variety of indicators still being developed, including simple things like tracing the path of an unusual cable or scratch marks on the floor, the players can discover these advanced traversal paths designed to lead not just to interesting tactical opportunities, but special loot and content rewards for those who spend a little extra time exploring. Mm. As for everything else you're seeing here, this is still very much a work in progress, with only the earliest of lighting, texture, and prop passes being complete. But it's a neat look at how these stations are pushing mm. not just into new dynamics visually, but a universe of possibility for additional exploration as well. And like with the outposts you saw at CitizenCon, they won't be assembled the same way each and every time. So you can never cool. be too certain what's around any corner. Members of the environment team also took a sprint to explore something on our backlog, namely the addition of small and medium-sized hangars to the ring structure of some space stations. It's a small touch, but these small yeah. touches they add up to make for a more dynamic landing and takeoff experience as players travel across the Star Citizen Persistent Universe. These are meant to replace the pads. The reason why they're doing this is because of griefers. Unlike Elite Dangerous, unlike Frontier, CIG is actually doing something about griefing. Something actually meaningful. So on all their space stations, I don't know about Port Olisar. Port Olisar is built completely differently. They may leave the pads there. I know they've been increasing the number of guns at Port Olisar. A uh, number of defensive guns. They've got orbital, they've got um, free floating defensive guns around Port Olisar. So. They might leave the pads there, but all the other stations, all the Lagrange Point stations where you take uh, raw materials to process, and all the orbital space stations where you can dock and refuel and rearm, they're taking the pads away and they're replacing them with these. With these um, hangers. Let's switch gears here. From bounty hunting to mining, from emergency response to Ooh. racing to espionage and security, as the reputation system continues to grow and expand within Star They're adding this. They're adding this to the reputation system. These are the career paths that you'll be able to take in the game. It's the only reason why they would add these. So they would have a racing career and uh, security and, and all that. Alrighty then. Not just bounty hunting. Wow. Our citizen, so too must the interface that represents it. Salvage. To that end, Medicine. explorations are underway mapping out the representative icons for some of the various mission type career paths currently in development for the Persistent Universe. Oh, yep. Now in a recent sprint, Icons for several hired muscle paths were proposed, <laughs> including kidnapping, kidnapping, home, smuggling, cool, and theft. Mm -hmm. Now, these aren't the full array of possible reputation paths, just a few that the UI team is currently making icons for. But we'll be covering Damn. more about this massive expansion of the reputation system and the various mission Lots types and activities of career that go along paths. with it as development continues. Yes, I can already tell that some of you are a little too excited to build your reputation in kidnapping. And it bothers me. He knows the game's audience. 
<laughs> Jared knows everyone too well. <sighs> Meanwhile, the lighting team recently completed a sanity pass on the RSI Mantis cockpit. Now these sanity passes are essential in ensuring the latest tech and process improvements reach assets that were built prior to their implementation, as well as keep some of the older stuff just looking as good as the newer. The Mantis. This happens on everything. Which, is this the, the, is just the salvage ship? Example of updates that don't just make the visual this appearance is the salvage better ship. than before, but are also more performative and less resource intensive. That's our version of tastes great, less filling. <laughs> They can also serve as terrific training opportunities to pass knowledge from older employees onto our newer hires as the company continues to grow. And speaking of growth, let's take a quick jaunt over to Orizon and look at some new executive offices being developed. Hmm. Now, these structures would be placed out on some of the raised landing platforms and provide a small, self-contained working area for Orison's bureaucracy, including an elevator down into the inner depths of platforms beneath. Wow. Of course, as for what adventures players may one day find in such an area, I'm not telling. Hmm. Mostly because I don't know yet. <laughs> I missed a meeting. Let's move on to some ship updates with this look at the continuing final art phase of the Vulture from Drake Interplanetary, where you can see all sorts of the smaller details. Okay, you'd this is the this is the uh, salvage the ship. Reads where some items in the back half seem to feel a little more chunky compared to those in the front. Mm, a little bit. It's pretty much just tightening things up and finishing them off now ahead of Salvage's intended release later this year. But before that happens, we've got the MISC Hull A barreling towards completion at the end of this quarter. About it's time they're finally getting this. Point. All the various Them getting this to work. This. All, all, all this. Because this actually moves. These are actually moving parts. Physicalized moving parts. Getting all this to move and getting all of this to, t to telescope in and out and closing in so the ship can land on the ground and then opening up in space so it can carry cargo and then dock with a space station. This has taken them years to finally get to the point to where they can actually do it. This has taken them a long time to do. This is the kind of tech, kind of... Uh, Technology engineering hurdles that they've been having to jump to make this game. Decals and decorations you might expect. But disclaimer here, those aren't the correct cargo boxes you're seeing here. The hmm. ship didn't just massively increase in size. It's just an artist having a little fun. <laughs> They're also adding the trademark Miss turret underneath the cockpit and continuing to refine the expanding and contracting cargo grid for all your shipping yep, needs. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, not, we'll they're not faking the it. It's actually before it's does it physically in the game. Of course, in Merchantman news, the team continues White Box phase, Ooh. working through the entirety of the ship's interior in their efforts to fully map it out before going into Gray Box. You can see some of the main bridge here with the pilot seats up front and the staircase to one of the primary turret rooms above. In White Box phase, it's simply about making certain every space has a purpose, has the room for players to achieve that purpose, and to do so with the signature organic shapes that have come to identify the Banu thus far. Hmm. Moving down to engineering, work continues making certain everything is to metric. Now, last time we showed it, the stairs here were getting just a little too pinched, so they've opened up the area a bit trying to make the whole room feel nice and grand within the confines of the current exterior. Hmm. And then in the habitation area, you can see the beginnings of a Banu shrine that we'll explore more of in the future. Hmm. And then here we have the interior turret area we mentioned before, which is shaping up to be quite different from any other turret you've experienced before. That looks like not 
quite the same. But that looks like the control chair for the drones in Stargate. Or the Atlantean drones. Almost looks like almost looks like that. Evoking that same sense of scale found throughout other areas of the ship. It's a massive gun. And this massive space that houses it is actually open to the decks below it, which should make for quite the view before the turret forms down around you and sucks you up into it. Ah. Raises above the exterior of the ship and then lets you pew pew to your heart's content. Hmm. Yeah, merchantmen people, this one's going to be worth the wait. All right, and then. finally, before we let you go, we started this week with derelicts and a mention of those colonialism outposts. So let's combine the two and look at an initiative the teams undertook to explore outposts of days gone past with these concepts that you can see here. Huh. Now, one of the many projects the team at Turbulent is working on are the systemic tools that will one day bring these to life across the pyro system. But as with all concepts, artists must first explore the ideas further and set the goals for those systems to build towards. That's the other thing that's been taking them a long time is in order to create all this stuff, they've been having to build tools. Because what, they, what they've done, especially with the planet tech, is they build tools that allow an artist to use, they use procedural generation, but they don't use it as a crutch. They use it as a tool. They use it as a paintbrush. And so for, for the planet tech people, they have tools that use procedural generation to create the landscapes, but the artists control it. So it's, I, I've seen it work. It's, it's really impressive. And it looks like they're, they're, they're doing similar things with this, building these old or abandoned outposts. And they'll be able to build those up in places. So instead of, Vast regions being completely empty who we'll run into places like this and it'll add lots more to the game Maybe there'll be things to find here. Maybe they will maybe they might look run down and they're still ha inhabited it Adds more life to the game, especially if they do this in pyro or uh, on Or on Hurston they could do this on Hurston they could do this on Microtech in the uh, Tundra regions, the warmer Tundra regions. That would be cool. And just like the Reclaimer derelicts from before, work has also begun creating the derelict outpost zoo that will one day serve as the basis for hand-placed points of interest first, hmm. then the systemic implementation still currently in development. Now, whether it's brand new or a hundred years old, each location is a new opportunity for story and gameplay hmm. to be found throughout the upcoming Pyro system. So what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that the process of making new things old and then new again is <laughs> well underway with the Reclaimer and Outpost derelicts. That advanced traversal means additional opportunities for loot and storytelling in the Outlaw space stations that the Banu Merchantman continues to make its impressive journey through White Box, and that the reputation system is on the cusp of expanding into a wide variety of legal and not so legal activities. <laughs> now, don't forget that Xeno Threat is still underway and Coromor is almost upon us with slick iridescent paints and hopefully no more Valentine's card contest that I, uh, I have to explain to my mother. <laughs> For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. We'll see you all next week. Cool. Alrighty then. So. Not as packed an Inside Star Citizen, but still... Still really good. Um, good progress on things that they're working on. I like that they're finally getting around to working on those um, hangers for the space station. Uh, I've never been pad rammed, but there are people who have, and it's 
beginning to be an issue, especially when there are free fly events, because you get jerks into the game that will come in, they'll take advantage of the free, the fact that you can sign up, sign up for free and fly any ship. And instead of just enjoying the game for what it is, they will troll other people and try to ruin their experience. You know, and they know that that's happening and they know that has to be dealt with. And they know that there are people who are trolling people in the game because people like to hate on Star Citizen, even though they know hardly anything about it. And most of the people who are very critical of the game actually know very little. If you look at a lot of the people who have been the biggest critics of Star Citizen, if you look at them and look at what they're saying, most of what they're saying is completely wrong or out of date for what the game's current state is. So they either directly lying or they looked at what other people were saying a couple of years ago and they're just regurgitating that thinking it's still current a lot of critics are just spewing out information that's not correct either de deliberately or through ignorance of what the current state of the game is Things are getting a lot better. They have been. Um, most of the 30Ks are virtually gone. Uh, early server meshing tech is in the game. That's what's eliminating a lot of the 30Ks. <laughs> They're going to be implementing more of that in the coming months. Uh, a big portion of that's coming with the next update, 317. And it has to be the, at least a static version of server meshing has to be in the game for Pyro to be implemented. And, and they are pushing hard to make Pyro ready for the update post, um, post Citizen Con. The update post Citizen Con. In fact, I think, or I think, I think they're pushing really hard to do 4.0 this year. Because this is the 10 year anniversary and they need to show pro major progress. Not because they're not making progress, they are. They need to show the rest of the gaming industry, the rest of the people out there that they are making progress. They've been on 3.0 for a couple of years, or 3.x for a couple of years. They need to move beyond 3.x now. And they need to, they need to produce something as well. And which is why Tiger and I think really they will have Squadron 42 out the door next year, early next year. And they need to, because they still have yet to prove they can actually produce a game. Now they're building one. And they're bu uh, building one that's actually pretty fun, despite the bugs. And they need to prove that they can produce a polished game. And the game, Squadron 42 would have to be polished. If they can do that, then... L. Well, it's just the wait till Star Citizen's finished. Which we estimate based on their current progress 2025. Well, anyway, that's been my reaction to Inside Star Citizen. This is a weekly video. I'll be doing another one next week. Don't know what that one will entail. You never know what they're going to talk about in these videos. Hopefully it will be something pertinent to 317 which is the next update coming. Hopefully we'll get an idea of exactly what they are committed to actually releasing with that update. So until then, I have been Mike DeZorch. Don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe, or just 
subscribe and hit that bell icon and uh don't forget to visit the gamers bay community the link on link for the community in miwi is in the description below and i will see you in the next video